the governor's press secretary. The email is from record columnist John Sikowski, asking, among other things, why the lanes were closed and when they might reopen. They did not respond right away. So that gave me carte blanche pretty much to uh, spend the time to talk to the travelers, people who are having this problem, the police chief, the mayor, who then says, maybe it's something I did wrong. The inkling, the idea started to germinate that maybe there was something more sinister about this than a simple lane closure for a traffic safety study. Although he's been fuzzy about whether the governor's people ever even officially asked him for an endorsement, Fort Lee Mayor Mark Sokolich recalls that after three days of gridlock and no word from the Port Authority, he started to get suspicious about what the lane closures were really about. At that point, I was almost convinced that it was retribution, but I didn't view it as a benefit to Fort Lee to enter into that political fright. I didn't. While Sokolich was getting radio silence, Sikowski was also hitting a stone wall. Now you probably know as a journalist that the Port Authority is not the quickest to respond to this kind of criticism. The PA's reputation for ignoring media inquiries is in fact legendary among reporters, and emails show media relations director Steve Coleman stonewalling them at every turn. I will not respond unless instructed to do so, he writes to Port Authority executives. He uses the same line again and again, at least 30 times. Druniak, now actively engaged in the damage control, expresses disdain for a reporter in one of the more profane emails we read. Meanwhile, Governor Christie insists that while Bridget Kelly assumed to have given the green light to the lane closures, David Wildstein, who gave the operational go, Bill Baroni, the agency's deputy executive director, and Bill Stepien, the governor's campaign manager, were all exchanging emails about it. He, the governor, knew nothing about the alleged conspiracy. Just so we're really clear, I had no knowledge or involvement in this issue, in its planning or its execution, uh, and I am stunned by the abject stupidity that was shown here, regardless of what the facts ultimately uncover. Even with the thousands of pages of emails already released, there is a lot about this matter that remains hidden under black marker. It is this information and more that two special legislative committees and the U.S. Attorney's Office will now seek to uncover, as what started as a two-bit lane closure now threatens to consume a governor and his presidential ambitions. In the newsroom, I'm David Cruz. NJTV News. All right, now we are going to talk about the legislature's investigation of the bridge scandal, the very latest. As David mentioned, both houses are forming special committees trying to find out who did it and why. Our Darry Koskert picks up the story there. Assemblyman John Wisniewski will head a special committee to continue investigating the bridge scandal. This comes less than 24 hours before the assembly's subpoena power expires. I want to ensure that we give all the tools and resources to this committee to actually be able to leave no stone unturned to find out, you know, what happened here cannot happen again. And an abuse of power like this is not uh, something that we all stand for. And I appreciate the confidence and support that they both have in uh, having me continue this investigation with the support of a super committee that will run a thorough, a fair uh, investigation so that we can follow the facts wherever they may lead us. The committee will be bipartisan, but who will be on it and how many Republicans will be on board hasn't been determined yet. Speaker-elect Vincent Prieto says he plans to reach out to Assembly Minority Leader John Bramnick about the committee membership. I would always like to see a committee to be 50-50. I know that's not going to happen, but it, I think in order to have credibility, you try to be as bipartisan as possible. The super committee will have an independent counsel. We'll likely find out who on Wednesday. Senator Loretta Weinberg called for a joint legislative committee, but assembly leaders decided against that. So Senate President Steve Sweeney is planning a separate one. We would have preferred to work with the assembly in a joint committee, but we're going to start our own committee on Thursday uh, with subpoena power to move forward. And hopefully we can coordinate our efforts as much as possible with the assembly because we both really do need to work together. The assembly had the lead on this and I did not want to change that uh, from the chairman and uh, we've been working well with the, with the Senate and as he said, uh, Senator Weinberg has been an integral part of this. It is her district, but at this time I thought it'd be better served that we continue what we were doing to just make sure that all the work we already had done, we can just uh, 
uh, expand from there with all the proper tools. Could these investigations lead to impeachment? That's way, way premature. And I think the assemblyman that threw it out there said that too. You can't jump to a conclusion. Well, right now, we're not there yet. You know, we're going to follow with the, you know, the evidence that comes before us. And listen, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. So I take everybody at their words. The assembly will vote on Thursday to extend subpoena power. If approved, Wisniewski says the two most likely to be subpoenaed next will be Bridget Ann Kelly and Bill Stepien. In Trenton, I'm Darry Kotzker, NJTV News. Joining us now is Senator Loretta Weinberg. Senator, we appreciate your being on the program. So you're going to chair Thank this you. new investigatory committee in the, in the state Senate. What specifically will you be looking for? Well, uh, we're, we'll be looking for the truth. What happened? Why did, it, why did it happen? And who authorized it? I think those were all very, very big unanswered questions. I was hoping that we'd have a joint committee with the Assembly, because the Assembly is creating a new committee, too. It isn't the Assembly Transportation Committee anymore. But since Assemblyman Wesneski and I have worked together very successfully, I think, over the last couple of months, I plan that we will be working together in the future. We have a lot of questions here about how this whole crazy scheme was hatched. Who thought up, let's create a traffic jam in Fort Lee? I don't think my instincts tell me it wasn't Bridget Kelly whose idea this was originally, but she has to be able to come before us and tell us in what context did this come up? Why did David Wildstein know what she was talking about when he got when he answered, got it? He didn't say, what are you talking about? He got it. He knew what she was talking about. So we need to find out who did it and why they did it. You know, there are all kinds of speculative theories out there because nobody has told the whole truth here. So you'll subpoena and her? Will you subpoena Bill Steppian, the governor's former campaign her. manager? Abs absolutely. Will you subpoena the governor? Uh, well, I think we'll have to see where this leads us. Uh, if, in fact, the governor is on the list where we need him to answer questions, I think we'll have to look into our constitutional authority to do so. And if, in fact, the Constitution allows us to do it, and there is a good reason for it, then we will do it. And his chief of staff, Kevin O'Dowd, will you call him? Oh, again, it depends upon where the facts of this lead us. I know I had a meeting with... Um, uh, his uh, chief of staff, Kevin O'Dowd, and I just checked the date in my calendar. It was November 18th. I had a meeting with him on issues unrelated to this, but at the end of that meeting, I said to him, please tell the governor I am not backing off on this, and it really is time for him to get to the bottom of it. That was on November 18th. Back date, another, another month back, September 19th. I wrote a letter to Commissioner Pat Schuber, really expressing my um, outrage at what took Bergen place County here. Former Bergen County executive, in fact. Exactly, and a commissioner on the Port Authority. I chose him because I knew he knew Bergen County and what this meant. And I copied the governor on that meeting, I mean, on that letter on September 19th. So the governor has known about this. If you didn't know about it before, he certainly has known about it since September 19th, unless people in his office, when they get a letter on Senate stationery from a member of leadership, decide to ignore it. The senator he was carbon only, copied. No, yeah. Sorry, only about 30 seconds left here. I understand you're sure. also, you and Senator Lesniak have now also called upon the Bergen County prosecutor, Mr. Molinelli, to conduct a criminal probe. Why is that? Well, uh, this happened in Bergen County. There is uh, a feeling afoot that certainly criminal laws might come to play in here. This was, in, uh, was executed in Bergen County. It affected residents all over the state of New Jersey, but the majority of whom live in Bergen County. So we think the prosecutor's office might be the right place to start a parallel investigation. Senator, we'll leave it there for now. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike.
major funding for NJTV News provided in part by New Jersey Manufacturers, Auto Insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Uh, joining us now from the State House, one of the governor's strongest critics, the senator and former governor himself, Richard Cody. Governor, good of you to join us once again. Are you surprised pleasure, where Mike. we find ourselves right now? Are you surprised where the governor finds himself? No. A lot of people predicted this would happen eventually. But in any event, Mike, I th think the next step in this investigation is to the redactions on Wildstein's emails have to be cleared and pronto. So we can find out exactly those names that he redacted and why he redacted them. Obviously, he felt it was sensitive in terms of names mentioned. So we've got to find out these other people who were involved this thing in this thing as well, Mike. Wildstein, during his testimony, his attorney said that were he to get immunity from the state and federal governments, that perhaps the committee would learn an awful lot more, would learn the whole truth. Do you think that uh, Mr. Wildstein should be immunized to get the whole truth? Well, that, that's a tough question to answer because, Mike, I don't know uh, what else he may or may not have done there. And uh, I think people wiser than me in the justice system have to make that determination. And I would hope that they would talk to the just, Justice Department about that as well because that's a very, very big step. But at the very least, Mike, we need to see these emails without any redaction so we can find out exactly who was in them and what they were saying and to whom. Because we all know Bridget Kelly didn't come up with this idea herself. And it seems, Mike, that there was a lot of interaction between the governor's campaign people and the governor's governmental people, which, as you know, at one point crosses the line because they're not supposed to be involved, either or. Uh, but clearly, there was a long time interaction on this particular issue between governmental officials and political officials of the governors. They ultimately both work for the governor. Do you think that the governor was directly involved? Yes, they do. But one, with this? one is not allowed no, no, at the oh, same no, I, time I, you're working for the I, governor I to be involved in politics. I understand that, okay. sir. I'm just using that as a predicate for this question. Knowing that both the political and the governmental folks who work for him had some degree of involvement, according to these emails and texts, do you think that the governor himself was directly or indirectly involved in the decision to close those lanes? I, I don't know that, Mike, and I can't say, but I think at some point, long before the press conference, he knew, and uh, uh, one of his initial press conferences, Mike, where he made reference to, oh, yeah, I was moving the cones myself, in my opinion, uh, that was done on purpose to try to get the press off this story. And I think, by the way, Mike, we all know that he, there's been political forces, even within my own party, uh, to stop this investigation. And you're speaking about whom specifically? Now, I, I, can't, I can't prove it, but I know because inside politics, there's all these rumors about uh, different people outside of the legislature, not elected uh, people. You're talking about what this. we commonly refer to as political bosses. The names that uh, most I'm frequently... Not, uh, go ahead, I don't want to put words in your name, mouth. I, but I'm, I'm not going to name any names because I, I don't know for sure, but I've been told by the most legitimate of sources uh, that there had been a move in the front and there may still be uh, to kill this thing. And that's not going to happen. You know that and I know that. So. so so, in other words, you as a Democrat are finding that there may be others pressing upon your party to just close this investigation down? Oh, the, there, there clearly was. Now, whether or not there still is, people tell me there still is, but that's not going to happen from either the Speaker or the President of the Senate. Uh, Senator, but one... clearly uh, there was an effort uh, to stop this early on. Senator, we have to leave it there. Always a pleasure. We appreciate your coming on, sir. My pleasure, Mike. Now, the bridge scandal is not the only potential legal problem for Governor Christie. Federal investigators are now taking a look at how the Christie administration used Hurricane Sandy relief funds for an ad campaign featuring New Jersey's first family. 
Our senior correspondent Desiree Taylor has that story. Because we're stronger than the storm. The Christie administration spent millions of dollars in federal Sandy aid on this campaign ad to promote the Jersey Shore, a campaign that prominently featured the governor and his family. My feeling was that it smelled. This was the, the block grant, the community development block grant money, and he needed to get a waiver uh, from HUD in order to do the ad campaign. And this money uh, could have been used as an alternative uh, to help uh, uh, my constituents. Pallone says a preliminary review warranted the need for an audit by the inspector general, but a spokesperson for the governor's office claims federal agency reviews are routine. Colin Reed says, quote, the Stronger Than the Storm campaign was approved by the Obama administration and developed with the goal of effectively communicating that the Jersey Shore was open for business. Reed goes on to say, we're confident that any review will show the ads were a key part in helping New Jersey get back on its feet after being struck by the worst storm in state history. Several Jersey Shore mayors and business groups still support the ad, but critics like Pallone question why the PR firm MWW won the contract to produce the ad campaign, even though a company called Sigma offered a lower bid. It's not the actual doing the advertising that is bothering me. It's the fact that the low bidder wasn't chosen and that the one that was chosen was twice the price. But MWW spokesperson William Murray says, quote, MWW's proposal included no mention or suggestion of using the governor in the paid advertising campaign. The decision to include the governor was arrived at after the contract was awarded, and he claims MWW's final proposal came in at the lower overall bid by $1.47 million and offered the lowest hourly rates of all bidders. Meanwhile, the losing bidder, the Sigma Group, says it looks forward to the outcome of the audit. President Shannon Mora says, we've been frustrated and disappointed about the price discrepancy since we first heard about it last August. The audit is expected to take several months to complete. Once it's finished, a report will be issued that could shed more light on the controversy. I'm Desiree Taylor, NJTV News. Governor Christie's job approval rating has dipped a bit since the bridge scandal emerged. It stood at 65 percent last month, according to the Monmouth University Asbury Park Press poll, but it fell to 59 percent over the weekend. Should point out this is the first time that the governor's job approval rating has dropped under 60 since Hurricane Sandy, but also point out it is still higher than the rating he had before the hurricane. Joining us now is our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron. Michael, always good to have you here for some sage advice and wisdom about all things political here. Uh, any governor usually would look at these numbers and say, that's great, but there's a six-point drop. I still think that if you're a, a Christie supporter, these are pretty good numbers under the circumstances to read the media you'd think that this guy would be under 50 percent, um, and he's not. So I, I don't think the numbers are problematic at this point. In fact, I, I think the governor could take heart on the eve of his State of the State address that uh, the majority of the people of New Jersey still approve of the job he's doing. State of the State is tomorrow. Who could have ever thought? I mean, these, these things are, are annual rituals, but it seems every year we've got something unusual to accompany them. Last year, uh, the speech was entirely about Superstorm Sandy. The year before that, in his State of the State, he proclaimed the New Jersey comeback has begun. The year before that, in his first State of the State, uh, he talked about turning Trenton upside down. Tomorrow, I guess the big question is, is he going to address the scandal? And I think he has to. Uh, well, in, in some ways, he has to, but I guess we all, he also runs the risk of reinforcing the very thing that he probably would like to turn the page on. Well, I mean, it's conceivable that he could get up there tomorrow and not say a, one word about this scandal and uh, assume that the public wants to talk about serious business and substance. But I just think this thing has gotten too big and that the, the pose he'll 
take tomorrow is more one of, uh, I come before you today with a heavy heart, but the state of the state of New Jersey is strong. And maybe reprise a little bit of what he said at his press conference last Thursday. Well, the Democrats will be covering their response as well. They certainly, I would assume, are not prepared to let this thing die. But one of the things that I'm asking myself tonight is why we heard from Senator Sweeney and we heard from Senator Weinberg that they wanted, in fact, to have a joint investigative committee with the state assembly. But that's not happening. Why do you think that that's, is not happening? That's a very interesting question. Uh, the Senate and the Assembly are not on the same page on this. Um, is it turf? I think it was Vincent Prieto's decision to uh, not go with the joint committee. I think Loretta Weinberg pushed it. I think John was, I'm told John Wisniewski was in favor of it. Uh, but Vinnie Prieto, as we heard earlier in the broadcast, said, I don't want to uh, derail an effort that so far has produced good results. I don't want to see it go two steps backward. Is, is it there, also could be some, there could be yeah. some jockeying for the limelight involved well, it's here. It's also his very first day and very first act as the new speaker. It was quite an act of independence. It defied the Senate president, in fact. We saw Senate President Sweeney saying, I'd have preferred a joint committee. Uh, I initially thought that maybe this had to do with jockeying for the Democratic gubernatorial mantle. I, I think John Wisniewski is now in the conversation uh, for 2017, or if it happens sooner, and maybe Steve Sweeney didn't want to see Wisniewski. If it happens it, sooner. I'm not going to let that one just fly out there. If it happens sooner. I mean, do you think this governor is in that kind of trouble where we could have to have a replacement or a special uh, election? I, I, didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, I was thinking more about if he happens to run for president and step down. I and I, I believe the, const, the, the lieutenant governor law specifies a special election occupy, uh, it, that November. The, uh, the charges made uh, by former governor, uh, Senator Cody, about uh, he wasn't going to name names or even address the uh, job descriptions of the people whom he was criticizing as having democratic sympathies but support for the governor and trying to kill the investigation, as he put it. Uh, I think we all know who he's referring to. Uh, he's been at war with those folks for quite a while. Do you think he has much of a case there? Well, I haven't heard directly from George Norcross, the South Jersey boss leader uh, on this, but yet what sprang to mind as I was watching you talk to Dick Cody and hearing him talk about that was that uh, Norcross was quoted two or three weeks ago as saying, why are we talking about lane closures when we should be talking about the success of Obamacare? Uh, as if he wanted to deflect attention away from the lane closure. Now, that was, all, that was before any of the revelations. I, I doubt Norcross would make a statement like that now. Well, no, I, in my understanding also, I saw a glimpse of, a, um, of an editorial in the Philadelphia Inquirer over the weekend, which was, in fact, rather critical of the governor. And this is a newspaper that is owned in large part by Mr. Norcross. Yeah, I don't think he writes the editorials. But uh, but, 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 but he has clout on that newspaper yeah, he where he could influence he, them he if he chose to. He, he certainly does. By the way, you made a point earlier about the, the Democrats being uh, all over this. Do you know that there are six investigations uh, underway right now? There, The Port Authority Inspector General, the Senate will have a committee, the Assembly will have a committee. U.S. Attorney Paul Fishman has said he'll look into it. Jay Rockefeller, the senator, and now the call for Molinelli at the state level, at the Bergen County level. Well, sooner or later we'll find out the whole truth, I suppose, but it'll be curious to see who gets to it first. Michael, and we'll be talking tomorrow with the State of the State. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Mike. That does it for us. Coming up tomorrow, we will have the governor's State of the State address and the Democratic response, both live. Our coverage starting at 3 p.m. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider. We thank you very much for watching. We hope you have a good night, and we'll see you back here once again tomorrow. NJM has been advocating safety on behalf of New Jerseyans for 100 years. One of our original objectives in 1913 was to promote the well-being of those engaged in manufacturing, trade, or commerce. In the century since, NJM remains committed to that mission. Grown in the Garden State, NJM is proudly celebrating a century of safety for our New Jersey neighbors. More about NJM is online at njm.com.
coming to Independent Lens. There is something about Berkeley that's different, a sense of an ideal. A great public institution. Are we going to school to get a job, or are we going to school to learn more about life? Under intense pressure. State funding is down to 16% of our total budget. From legendary filmmaker Frederick Weisman. You belong to one of the world's most powerful knowledge-producing institutions. What are you going to do with your knowledge? It's an unprecedented look at Berkeley. Join us tonight at 10 on 13. Check out what 13 has going on with the New York Islanders on Sunday, March 23rd at 1 p.m. This. Curious Door. Yep. Synthesize Join the Islanders on Sunday, March 23rd, when we face off against the Blue Jackets for WNET Family Day. For a donation of $500, you'll receive four tickets to the game and four VIP passes to an exclusive meet and greet with all the characters and yours truly. Your donation helps support public television to remain commercial free and uninterrupted. Hope to see you March 23rd. Don't miss this great opportunity to meet Kyle and some of your favorite public television friends like Curious George and the Man with the Yellow Hat, Daniel Tiger, Dinosaur Train's Buddy, Sid the Science Kid, and Word Girl. Call 1-800-468-9913 to make your pledge now. The Beatles, Cassius Clay, this was the toppling of the order. It was the year we stood up. We want freedom by any means necessary. And split apart. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. It was a door to our future. Once we went through it, there was no going back. 1964 on American Experience. Join us Tuesday night at 8 on 13. Next time on Frontline. The North Korea, the regime doesn't want seen. If people stop believing in the regime, that means central control is breaking down. With undercover footage and exclusive interviews, Frontline uncovers a new generation risking their lives to smuggle information in and out. Any kind of uprising, you will probably fail, and all your relatives will be sent to prison camps. Inside the secret state of North Korea. Join us Tuesday night at 10 on 13. Like Downton Abbey on Masterpiece? Then you'll love 13.org slash Downton Abbey. Check out exclusive content, previews, full episodes, and connect with other fans. Curb your craving for everything crawly 24-7. Online at 13.org slash Downton Abbey. Antiques Roadshow has good news for some lucky folks in Boise. You look for certain whistles and bells and objects like this. Well, this one has the whole orchestra. Wow. Goosebumps today. <laughs> I'm not giving it back. You won't want to miss these discoveries next time on Antiques Roadshow. Join us tonight at 8 on 13. This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Gerrin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Up to the minute stock market news and in depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Stumbling start. Stocks tumble, extending their losses for the year so far. So what is holding the market back? And are there more declines ahead? Who's buying the drinks? Bourbon maker Beam is being acquired by a Japanese firm. The price tag, $14 billion. And now investors want to know who's next. The aftermath. Target's CEO speaks for the first time about that big data breach, promising significant changes as the entire industry embraces the tech sector to prevent the next strike. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, January 13th. Good evening, everyone. A troubling way to kick off a new week of trading, a major sell-off on Wall Street today. What triggered it? Anxiety about the first batch of earnings from big corporate heavyweights that are coming out this week. A Goldman Sachs report saying stocks are too pricey. And then to top it off, more taper comments from a top Federal Reserve official. That was enough to give investors the jitters. The Dow posted its biggest one-day decline in more than three months. Those blue-chip Dow stocks tumbled almost 180 points. That's a drop of almost 1 percent. The Nasdaq fell even harder, losing 61 points, or 1.5 percent. 
the S&P was down by 23. Bob Pisani has more on today's market action and trader talk at the New York Stock Exchange. Stocks started mixed but moved lower midday and closed essentially on the lows for the day. Goldman Sachs issued a report on stocks saying valuations were lofty by almost any measure. Then midday, Atlanta Fed President Dennis Lockhart said he would continue to support the Fed's tapering program. Lockhart came out today and said that the uh, Fed is going to continue their quantitative easing policy. And uh, after that uh, weak non-farm payroll number that came out last Friday, mm -hmm. I think that sent a little confusion in the market and really uh, set the tone for the sell-off we saw today. Another issue for the markets is the strength in bonds. Many are speculating that pension funds have taken profits on their big stock gains in 2013 and are now using the money to buy longer-dated bonds, which now offer more attractive yields. Now, despite these issues, there was very little sense of real panic in the markets today. Today's decline was very orderly. The volume, however, was a little bit above average. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, on a day when Goldman Sachs is saying the market is overvalued, some companies were looking for value, finding it, and making deals. After the market closed, Google agreed to pay $3.2 billion in cash for a company called Nest Labs. It makes high-tech versions of devices like thermostats and smoke detectors. It's Google's second biggest takeover ever. Also after the bell, Charter Communications sent a letter to Time Warner Cable, offering $132.50 a share, cash and stock. That adds up to $61.3 billion for that cable operator. Staggering takeover bid that would combine two of the nation's biggest cable TV service providers. But the biggest deal, an acquisition in the spirits business, with Japan's Suntory buying Beam, one of America's best-known liquor makers, Price tag, $14 billion, all cash, and that sent shares of Beam bubbling higher, closing nearly 25% of the upside. Sarah Eisen now with more on the buyout of Beam and what the deal means to the spirits industry. The company behind Yamazaki Whiskey and Midori Liqueur, Suntory, is adding Maker's Mark and Cavassier Cognac to its portfolio. This was the only